Good morning, good day, and good evening. Thank you for joining the third MIRI seminar on current affairs addressing institutionalization and mainstreaming human rights. My name is Svetlusha Surova, and I'm the founder and senior researcher at Minority Issues Research Institute headquartered in Bratislava. And I'm delighted to welcome you all today to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Today, we will talk about mainstreaming human rights within the U United Nations and how uh, states put an effort to institutionalize them globally with two esteemed experts, Dr. Maria del Mar Logrono Narbona and uh, Sir William Pace. Thank you both for your time and willingness to talk uh, at our MIRI seminar. The discussion will be moderated by Dr. Mirsad Krieštorac, our senior researcher, and he will shortly introduce the affiliations and short biographies of our uh, speakers. Uh, gratitude uh, to Mirsad for leading the panel. And finally, thanks to all panelists uh, for joining us today and the participants. Before I hand over the floor to Mirsad and our experts, I would like to emphasize why the declaration and our topic are so important today. The declaration enshrines the rights of every human being. And it was the first document that established that fundamental human rights should be protected universally. And uh, uh, moreover, during the different crises such as environmental or health, war and conflicts, uh, they all uh, uh, pose a serious threat to human uh, rights and they always affect the most vulnerable ones. And uh, since the adoption of the declaration, many states have uh, uh, made already efforts to protect and guarantee the human rights, but not all persons have access to rights. Um, usually those vulnerable and most marginalized face a problem of equal access to human rights. And uh, here at MIRI, we are dedicated to conducting research on minority issues and we promote the rights of minorities worldwide. And it can never be stressed enough that minority rights are part of human rights and they are the right that enable uh, minorities to survive, literally, physically uh, to survive and to preserve and develop their distinct identities and to en ensure uh, the, the, their full equality in societies. So I hope that the discussion will address the issues and challenges pertinent to human rights today. And let's start. The Mirsad, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mr. Krieštorac, and I'm joining um, our conversation today from South Florida, from the hot weather in South Florida. It is my pleasure to be with you all today and moderate this important conversation, which intends to remember the 75th year anniversary of the United Nations adaptation of the adoption of the Uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a common standard for all member states. A commission of 18 elected members led by John Humphrey and René Cassin by the fall of 1948 completed brief statement of principles that was later adopted as the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations General Assembly on December 10, 1948. The declaration had a global endorsement by all member states at the time and ever since then all other subsequent United Nations member states embraced the declaration as well. Yet, the declaration is still not a legally binding document, and it even describes itself only as a common standard of achievements. That is why, ever since 1948, numerous individuals, non-governmental organizations, and state institutions have worked diligently to make those agreed upon common standard, standards a reality at every level of human interactions and in all circumstances. This is also why we cannot, we can consider that day as a starting point for the common era of a global rule-based world system. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was a lot of talk 
and calls for upholding that rule-based international system. Well, the very important part of that rule-based system are the commonly agreed upon standards of human rights. Let us remember that a human right is a natural duty owned by an individual toward other individuals, a duty that may not be overridden for the sake of marginal gains and ostensibly good consequences, and that right is owned and grounded on some feature shared with all human beings. Obviously, in the situation of war, which now find ourselves, these ideas and norms are put under severe strain. However, it is important to note that agreed upon norms of human rights are to be upheld at all times and in all situations. Human rights are never to be forgotten or put aside for any reason and in all situations. Human rights are not and should not be conditioned upon citizenship or situation of war or peace or political, economic and any other reasons. We consider human rights to be a basic minimum standards for all our interactions. As the great Mahatma Gandhi have insisted, all people of earth have human rights just because they're human and therefore they're all equal in those rights with any other human, regardless of their origin or state citizenship. Yet there are still challenges for all of us to make this norm a reality. One of the greatest challenges is described in an article written to mark the International Human Rights Year of 1968 by René Cassin, when he wrote that now that we possess an instrument capable of lifting or easing the burden of oppression and injustice in the world, we must learn how to use it. And that 1968 statement still stands to be valid and very topical indeed. It is a good suggestion for all of us to learn how today to use those standards that our predecessors have established. So let us now learn more about it from our two guest presenters. I will briefly introduce them, and then we will start with a short presentation about the issue of mainstreaming of human rights within the United Nations structures and on the global efforts to institutionalize human rights as a legal concept, at least through the establishing and work of the International Criminal Court. Our first guest is Dr. Maria Del Mar Logronio Naborna, and she is an independent researcher, analyst, and expert consultant. She used to be in academia, and during that time, she was a principal investigator of two social science research council grants under the uh, Islam in the World Context program. She's a uh, uh, she's the author of specialized articles, leading contributor of specialized reports, as well as co-author of the edited volume Crescent Over Another Horizon, published by University of Texas Press in 2015. As an expert consultant, she has undertaken social analysis for the U.S. government agencies, gender analysis among Palestinian refugees with UNRWA, life skills and citizenship education in MENA with UNICEF, analysis of public perception satisfaction with local administration in the context of decentralization in Jordan and design of educational integration program for refugees in Germany with lots of acronyms which we will provide links for them on our website MIRI International please visit to see it. She has been a serious advisor to Arab Renaissance for Democracy and Development uh, organization since 2014 and uh, on its programs related to access to justice, social protection, and gender and gender justice. Dr. Laguorno got her PhD from University of California in Santa Barbara in 2007. She's joining us today from the snowy Tashkent in Uzbekistan, where she's now on an assignment, and we appreciate her willingness to participate in this MIRI seminar on current affairs. Our second presenter will be Mr. William Pace, Mr. Pace is the director for the Center for the Development of International Law. Formerly, he served as the convener of the Coalition for an International Criminal Court since its founding in 1905. It's essentially a coalition of over two and a half thousand NGOs. Mr. Pace was also a co-founder and a steering committee member of the International Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect, formerly, right? 
He has been engaged in international justice, rule of law, environmental law, and human rights for the past 30 years. He has previously served as the Secretary General of the Hague Appeal for Peace and the Director of Section Relations of the Concept for Human Rights Foundation at Amnesty International, among other positions. He was the President of the Board of the Center for United Nations Reform Education and an advisory board member of the One Earth Foundation, as well as the co-founder of NGO Steering Committee for the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development, an NGO working group on the United Nations Security Council. Mr. Pace is the recipient of the William Butler Human Rights Medal from the Urban Morgan Institute for Human Rights and currently serves as a Ashoki Foundation Fellow. He has authored numerous articles and reports on international justice, international affairs, and United Nations issues, multilateral treaty processes, civil society participation in international decision making. He was also the executive, he was also the executive director of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Peace, now retired, right? And indeed a hefty human rights resume. We're going to try to provide, as I said, web links for all these important works and organizations that our today's guests are part of or were part of, and please visit MIR International for them. As usual for this type of seminars, we're going to first hear from our guests who are going uh, about uh, this issue of mainstreaming and institu institutionalization of agreed upon human rights for a few minutes, and after that, we will open the discussion for your questions and answers. As we did before, if you want to ask a question, please raise the hand icon and we'll call upon you. Once the microphone is on, please introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from and then ask your question. Those of you who cannot join over the microphone, you're welcome to type in your question in the chat box and we will try to ask them on your behalf. Now, thank you all for cooperation. And now let us turn the attention to Dr. Lagorno. Dr. Lagorno, please. Take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Media Institute and to you, Mirsad and uh, Svetlusa, for a wonderful introduction. Today, what I will do, um, uh, as you asked me to talk about the institutionalization of human rights, I will be wearing my civil society hat as a senior advisor to ARDD. ARDD stands for Arab Renaissance for Democracy and Development, it's a Jordanian NGO. Uh, that works locally in Jordan, but also regionally in the, in the MENA region, in the Middle East and North Africa region. And I work as an advisor on social protection and access to justice, uh, mostly. When you ask me, and when you ask me to reflect on the institutionalization of human rights, the first thing that I thought, particularly on on the date of December 11th, December 10th, the 75th anniversary of the Declaration of the Human Rights, the first thing that came to mind, uh, speaking from from the region where I work in, is that human rights are under siege. That's the first thing that came to mind, and that reminded me of a uh, of a um, fantastic uh, short article, short advocacy piece by Philip Alston, the former um, um, UN rapporteur for extreme poverty, in 2000 that he authored in 2017. So what I will do today uh, is to give you a, a little bit of headlines of what does human right, what do human rights mean uh, to civil society organizations like us and revisit that article, uh, short pieces on the five issues that were um, highlighted by Philip Alston back in 2017 and the recommendations that were ensued by reviewing where are we now in these recommendations and those five parts. So I thought, and those five issues. So the, the, that's the structure of the short uh, conversation today. Human rights. Um, I often hear they are too Western, too neoliberal, too apolitical, not enough. But what it really is for NGOs like us, they remain the closest things for our lingua franca. They represent, they help us represent and demand and redress social injustice and suffering. And it is critical. As you, as you both said, uh, it's an important day to remember. And it is critical that we remember those are the, the minimum guarantees that we could all come up with after a, a, a very 
uh, heinous period of history, and I speak as a historian. As NGOs, we embrace the history, the language, and the institutions of human rights to advance agendas for positive transformation and bring about social justice and accountability. This is, this is the main goal. So for us, human rights are, are critical. They are not too apolitical, they are neutral, and they establish those basic minimum warranties. And although as civil society organizations, we spend a lot of time engaging in conversations with institutions, UN institutions, and other international fora like the ICC or the Office of the Human Rights Council uh, with the Universal Periodic Review, which is a, a, a major activity that is undertaken at a country level and where NGOs participate in or try to participate in a critical manner, we cannot reduce human rights to these legal and technocratic approaches. As civil society, for us, human rights have a dimension that enables political challenge challenge and bottom-up mobi bottom mobilization. So I want to take us to that language of mobilization and positive transformation and think about what are some of the challenges and what needs to be done? Where are we now with the perspective of those of that article that I mentioned, uh, Philip Alston found uh, uh, authority back in 2017. The article was entitled again, uh, Human Rights Under Siege, and they were written right after um, uh, President Donald Trump came to the presidency and that caused a little bit of upsetting around the world. Um, but we're reading it six years after, it looks um, and reflecting on the meaning of the issues that he was highlighting in 2017 and the road ahead. Definitely, we are going through a very upward road right now, and we've been going on for a while. So the five issues that Philip Aston mentioned in this short article were four pages, and uh, I think that Miri will be able to oppose this very important article, uh, advocacy article. The first main challenge that uh, Dr. Alston was mentioning was the populist threat to democracy. And again, it was written in 2017 uh, with some of the political context in mind, but he was actually talking about the, the efforts and, and, and the challenges that uh, that were brought by the post 9-11 era and the security concerns that uh, um, had uh, an actual or constructed, that translated into an actual or constructed fear, and I'm quoting here, of hatred of foreigners or, and or minorities. And quoting again, these concerns were exploited by governments of many different stripes to justify huge trades off, for example, insecurity that can only be achieved by restricting freedom of movement, privacy, non-discrimination norms, or even personal integrity warranties. The second main issue, the second main challenge for human rights that was highlighted in 2017 by Dr. Alston was the role of civil society and the shrinking of civil space that we are facing. That has not stopped, and that has increased over the past six years in a tremendous manner. In countries uh, setting in the MENA region, are incre it's incredibly important to think about the, this shrinking space of civil society. More and more is complicated. We are facing major laws undermining our right to express freely what we need to express, to address the issues that we need to address. And this is actually critical from our perspective. The third issue at the time, and we have to remember, uh, Dr. Alston was the, the special rapporteur, the UN special rapporteur on extreme poverty. He highlighted the linkage between inequality and exclusion and human rights. The argument was that mostly human rights are usually about advocating for political rights. But we often forget that there is a whole issue of economic and social rights that need to be also upheld. This is actually something that, um, uh, as as we will, as I will uh, shortly tell you uh, in in a couple of minutes, that has been redressed in, in in some sense. But just to remember that, yes, it is a challenge. Human rights sometimes are, is seen as not engaging with larger concerns of the population, as something being of a of a of a, of a field for only few. But that's. Uh, something that over the past six years, I think civil society organizations have managed to overcome. The fourth issue is, uh, I think we are uh, living through as we speak, is the undermining of the international rule of law, as Philip Alston put it, specifically the systematic undermining, and I'm 
quoting, of the rules governing the international use of force by Western countries, the US and its ever supportive, never questioning allies such as the United Kingdom and Australia, and their assiduous efforts to rationalize targeted killings and other acts. Um, of course, his reflection was on how the position that how this position undermined uh, speaking for human rights and on behalf of human rights. And the fifth and final concern that he raised in this paper was related to the fragility of international institutions, highlighting how the International Criminal Court in particular, and we will be uh, we, will, we will listen to Bill Pace on this, was uh, under sustained attack at the time, I would argue still is under sustained attack, and the very little regard for the European Court of Human Rights or the Human Rights Council, etc. Those key institutions that enshrine and that mainstream human rights on an everyday basis. Now, these are the concerns that were highlighted in 2017. What were the recommendations that Dr. Alston provided? Well, in short, he called for the recognition of the importance of collaboration to enhance economic and social rights, to promote diverse partnerships, persuasive advocacy, and a scholarly of responsibility and individual contributions. But let me go one by one of the recommendations and see how have we moved far? What are the changes that we have seen over the past six years to take a stock on some of the issues that are relevant to mainstreaming human rights. One of the recommendations he provided, the very first one was about local and international synergies, the need for effective collaboration between international and local human rights movements. International NGOs, he said, should focus on building complementing national capacity rather than having an extractive approach. Both international and local advocacy are essential depending on the situation. How has this been addressed in the past six years? My argument and the argument of a lot of civil society organizations would be that yes, it has been addressed through what we called the localization efforts. What is localization? Localization in human language refers to the efforts aimed at decentralizing and localizing within different geographic realities and national grounded realities, different development initiatives. The approach recognizes the importance of involving local actors, communities, and governments in shaping and implementing policies and programs that, direct, in, that directly impact our lives. The localization agenda is often associated with the sustainable, sustainable development goals, but they are not only, they should not only be associated with the SDGs, they are context, they are attempts to bring to national ground concerns that are global and concerns that can be and up, up to the frontline local concerns. Why do I say that localization is important? Because for organizations like us, um, localization has meant that we have a stronger voice in the international arena, but it's not as strong as it should be. And that synergy, it's difficult in its implementation, meaning large organizations, large international non-governmental organizations usually like to take the lead on a constant basis. And it can be a, an exercise of checking the box. We will localize means we will just put a local partner and have them uh, and incorporate them in the writing of a proposal of a project, but not really engage into a serious conversation. Our hope as a local uh, national organization is that this conversation will continue and will engage us further and in a more meaningful way. The second recommendation that uh, Dr. Alston did related to precisely enhancing economic rights. Uh, they must be integral to the human rights agenda. By 2017, uh, in, two, in the 1970s, uh, social and economic rights were critical. They, neoliberalism uh, made us turn us, turned us away from the importance of defending those rights to a large extent. But arguably, we had the 2008 financial crisis that brought back that impetus, particularly on the social protection floors, ILO resolution uh, recommendation that said we have to have a minimum guarantees protected, even though we have the right to social security, we still need to push for that because the financial crisis made everyone look at it. After Philip Alston authored his, uh, his paper in 2017, we've gone through COVID-19 and COVID-19 has shown us once over 
in 2020, 2021, the importance of resilient social protection systems and how we need to work with them. And the only way to do that is by reminding governments and international actors of the rights of economic and social rights. So COVID-19 was a good wake up call for us to move into the economic rights and a lot of success has happened. Of course, the, event, the, the events in Ukraine, now the events in, in Gaza, are taking us back from that agenda, uh, but it's a constant struggle. This is what we need to defend. But it's back in it, it's back, and it's back in a strong manner. The third recommendation uh, that Philip Aston provided was broadening the base. Human rights community is encouraged to expand horizons by engaging with larger corporations and exploring alliances with potential allies beyond traditional boundaries. And I think this is very much what agendas like the business and human rights agenda are exploring. We have private sector and human rights agenda. So for some people is a diluted version of what social and economic rights should be about, but it also engages with a broader, uh, a broader base than we usually would not engage, except for social dialogue, the tripartite social dialogue uh, sponsored by the International Labour Organization. Persuasion, that's the fourth recommendation that Philip Alston provided. He highlighted the importance of being persuasive and convincing. He urged human rights advocates to move away from absolutism, acknowledging the need for compromise with consistently advancing core values. There's a lot of advancing core values and a lot of compromise that needs to be done on an everyday basis by civil society organizations. I would not consider any of the organizations that I work with and that we work with that have as an absolute, it's <laughs> promoting absolutist values or standards. The role of the scholars, Mirsad, uh, we have on here Miri, he called for scholars to fulfill their responsibility as teachers, researchers, and publicists. And I think this seminar is testimony to these efforts and the importance that it has. And also the importance for scholars to suggest alternative strategies and not just highlight shortcomings. We like to analyze, we are analysts, but at the same time, we need to work. And working uh, in civil society and working now in the development field away from academia, I really feel the need, and these are the conversations that we engage with when we talk to academics. We need solutions. There's a lot of analysis and it's extremely important, but we need solutions and we need to think creatively about it. And last but not least, what is it that each of us can do? we all have an individual responsibility to uphold human rights. And individuals are urged to reflect on our contributions to human rights. We can all make a difference in our own way at every time, whether through gestures, financial contributions, supporting the work of civil society organizations. This is critical and remains critical. Thank you very much. I think you are muted, Ms. Lai. Indeed, I said we as a media, we're trying to do that. Our director, Dr. Swidlusha, just last week have presented at the United Nations about the very important work she did on Roma population in Slovakia. So we are trying very hard to, to um, take up that call. Now let's hear from Mr. Pace. And then after that, we can engage in questions and answer. Mr. Pace will give us a very important how you say overview of that institutionalization efforts towards the establishing human rights as a legal principle. And he was very instrumental part of that uh, effort to establish International Human Court, which is one of those instruments. So please, Mr. Pace, go ahead. Thank you very much. And as I indicated in the chat, I'm at a unoccupied or un used a conference room at the UN. I hope governments and UN staff don't come throw me out uh, in the middle of this uh, presentation. Well, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a very important uh, moment to celebrate this extraordinary achievement. Uh, I know it sounds a little pessimistic, but I would say in the context of the last uh, 15 years or so of of history, that if we had not created a universal declaration of human rights, if we had not created a number of institutions I will mention over the last uh, 75 years, 
it would be almost impossible to get them agreed to today by governments. Uh, it is, uh, human rights are not written in the stars. They are an achievement of millions of individuals working over thousands or well, thousands of years, but especially the last two or 300 years and the last 150 years, perhaps even most importantly. I'm here to talk about uh, the creation of the International Criminal Court, uh, which was an achievement in uh, 1998 in Rome uh, by uh, 150 governments who were working uh, together uh, to create a treaty. Uh, um, part of the history begins in the mid 1980s and mid 1980s was a time when uh, 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 the Cold War was ending or it was beginning to end. You saw very major changes uh, going from autocracies to democracies um, in uh, Latin America, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile, et cetera, in Africa, in the Middle East, et cetera. So um, uh, that period of time and the, the effort that brought the International Criminal Court, of course, first it began with uh, the United States at the end of World War II, insisting on creating tribunals to hold individuals who were leaders of the uh, Nazi movement and committed unbelievable crimes, uh, hold them individually responsible. Uh, there was an effort in the late 40s and early 50s to create a, uh, a general assembly uh, tribunal, but it took until the mid 1990s for this to occur. It occurred in part because of certain individuals um, Arthur Robinson, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, um, who was able to get the CARICOM, the Caribbean countries, to bring to the General Assembly a resolution in 1998 uh, and 1999 to, uh, one, create an international criminal court, and two, to create a UN decade of international law. Um, he was supported to some degree by the non-aligned movement, which was a uh, historically has not been thought of as a movement favoring uh, individual human rights, but which after the United States lost an important um, case in the world court over putting bombs in the harbor of Nicaragua, uh, many countries began to think, well, maybe international law could work for us. Um, the uh, the history of the uh, uh, creation of this process uh, begins with understanding that the permanent members of the Security Council opposed an effort to create an, in, an independent international criminal court, uh, the veto members, uh, but it was a group of about 15 to 20 countries at the beginning, like-minded countries from uh, the Caribbean, from Latin America, from Western Europe, uh, North America, even small island states that came together. That group grew to um, about uh, 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 45 after a couple of years, 96, 97, and then by 98, it was 75 uh, organizations of, the not, of, a, of an informal group of of governments, mostly small and middle power nations who came together uh, in Rome to uh, uh, try and advance this treaty. One of the significant other individuals that I would mention was the foreign minister at that time of the United Kingdom. He came into power uh, with uh, Tony Blair in 1997, and he had been the shadow foreign minister for years. Uh, and whereas Amnesty and other advocates could never get to talk to the formal ministries of, of the UK, you could talk to the shadow minister. So when Robin Cook came in as, as foreign minister, he wanted to be able to join this like-minded group of governments. To do so, he had to renounce that the treaty would be controlled by the Security Council and therefore controlled by the uh, veto. Um, international laws are usually convened by the United Nations 
organizations, legal advisors, and then nation states individually have to decide to sign the treaty and then to have their legislatures or governments exceed or ratify th th those treaties. Um, and this was a treaty that was expected by many to take 15, 20, 30 years to be ratified. As I said, it was agreed to uh, after a five-week meeting in Rome in 1998. The vote to adopt it was 120 yes, seven no, and about 30 countries abstained, which most of them probably didn't have instructions from capital on what to do. But there was 120 that agreed and only seven that voted no, which included the United States, um, China, et cetera, uh, in, in, in opposing it. Um, in 2002, uh, by a historic uh, uh, expedition, 60 governments had ratified the treaty and the treaty entered into force on July 1, uh, 2002. Today, it has about 125 governments that have ratified the treaty. Um, of these, uh, 33 are African, 19 are Asia Pacific, 18 are East European countries, 28 are Latin American and Caribbean countries, uh, and 25 are Western Europe and other group. Um, uh, Ukraine accepted the jurisdiction of the uh, Rome Statute uh, and the ICC um, in 2015, in April of 2015. Uh, Palace, uh, uh, Palestine, um, well, they, they accepted the jurisdiction, but Palestine actually ratified it the treaty in April of 2015, and Ukraine accepted your jurisdiction in 2014, actually, but hasn't acceded to, to the court yet. Um, uh, and, and and recently, five uh, nations have, uh, have referred what is going on in uh, Israel and, and, and Gaza, Gaza and, and, and Pakistan to the court. Uh, so the prosecutor of the court is now uh, seriously considering these issues. Um, again, it's, uh, the International Criminal Court Treaty is a great human rights treaty, international law treaty, disarmament treaty, humanitarian law treaty, peace treaty. Um, in the uh, post-Cold uh, War, um, uh, we have seen in, since the mid-1980s some enormous progress. Uh, in 1989, a children's convention, an indigenous per, uh, persons convention, the, the 92 Earth Summit, and 1993, the uh, uh, High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights and a World Conference on Human Rights, uh, 1995, the, the Social uh, Conference, uh, a world, uh, the World Trade Organization was developed, um, and as I said, in 1998, the, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, um, and by 2004, the first prosecutor and judges were elected. I'm currently at the 22nd meeting of the of treaty, the Assembly of State Parties of the treaty. Um, and uh, and at this meeting, I think uh, important issues are being discussed, including adding the crime of ecocide to the to the treaty. In addition, uh, there is a effort to uh, strengthen the crime of aggressions uh, procedures. Uh, I'm going to uh, have to relocate because they are starting the meeting here in a few minutes time and uh, uh, but I will finish my interventions and then uh, relocate so um, the uh, there's no question that the, the way in which the United States reacted to the attack in the United States on 9-11, on September 2001, uh, creating this um, war of aggression or a war against terrorism, 
uh, committing aggression in Iraq, which was supported by the United Kingdom. And now we have an aggression in Ukraine by Russia. So we have three of the five permanent members of the Security Council that have committed acts of aggression. Um, and we're also seeing, I think, at this point, a re retreat in trust, a retreat, a rise of authoritarianism. Uh, we, and as I said, I don't think we could create these institutions today uh, if, if we were. Um, I'm wanting quickly to mention three um, things that the students ought to be looking at. One is a book called The Internationalist, uh, which is about the impact of the Kellogg-Briand Kellogg Treaty Pact of 1928 by Professors Hathaway and Shapiro. A wonderful biography on Einstein's politics called Einstein on Peace. And the third, a, an important book called Je Guns, Germs, and, and Steel by Gerald Diamond, uh, The Fate of Human Societies. Um, lastly, I'd like to mention that how important I think it would be uh, for uh, students and the academics to listen to Yuval Noah Harari's 22-minute YouTube lecture on artificial intelligence and the extreme dangers that this these developments present. But as I said, I'm going to have to excuse myself and find a, another location because the Arab group is about to meet and, uh, and I will try and come back to this important meeting on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as soon as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pace. Um, uh, it was a, a brief but important uh, uh, overview of what was achieved thus far. And it seems to be that both from both presentation, from the presentation of Dr. Logroño and presentation of Mr. Pace, it looks like that we are now in a situation where we need to hold the ground, right? Whatever it is achieved up until now, um, you know, we we are as a as people, as a as a humanity, we are to hold the ground and insist on this uh, uh human rights achieved thus far as um as a, um, as a standard, right, which we would not essentially compromise on. So now we already have some questions. Uh, obviously, we're going to wait for Dr. Pace, uh, for Mr. Pace to rejoin us. Yes, um, but uh, we can ask the questions to Dr. Logroño uh, and uh, essentially um, see Dr. Logroño. Somebody have asked, can you essentially clarify what means mainstreaming? Like we spoke about mainstreaming of human rights, and people may not know what means mainstreaming of human rights. And I can briefly say that um, that people may be surprised, but human rights is not a central issue within the United Nations functioning, and it is not central issue that is often considered in international relations. And so mainstreaming would mean essentially to assert the issue of human rights to be uh, important in all, like I said in the introduction, in all interactions. But let's see, Dr. Lagorno, can you help us understand that mainstreaming a little bit better? Thank you, Mirsad. Well, um, indeed, we are holding the ground right now, and we're also holding the ground. There have been better times. And uh, as Mr. Pace was pointing out, there have been times in recent history where we have managed to move forward with a positive transformation agenda that includes the, the creation of institutions that are critical to hold accountability and to promote accountability globally, like the International Criminal Court. Mainstreaming human rights was a fantastic concept. Uh, well, it, it's, a, it's a very needed concept that we need to hold because since 2000 to 2010, more or less, we had this universe, this decade of uh, human rights at yeah, the UN. That was a kind of a golden era of mainstreaming human rights. And that was under the mandate of uh, Mr. Kofi Annan. He declared human rights to be at the center. And there were a series of reforms at the UN that actually strengthened the institutionalization of human rights, including the reworking of the Human Rights Council. The, now, in 2023, we have to constantly remind uh, every time, as civil society, again, 
and uh, even to the to you to the UN is it colleagues working sometimes that we are using a human rights based approach. This is one of our main tenets: a human rights based approach. We are not doing this because it's the right in the constitution. No, it's because it's a human rights based approach. This is what we as civil society need to keep reminding. It used to be a different case. And if you just, if you are curious and you just go in and do a, a little, I'm a historian by training. So I like to look at uh, thing. I, I like to look at the different trends throughout history. If you look at documents at the UN through the nineties and the two thousands, you will see particularly in the late nineties and the 2008, all the way until 2007 and 8, how there is this human rights and bringing up to the uh, call by uh, Mr. Kofi Annan on human rights and human rights based approach. It became a little bit of a token word, and we this is what uh, we are trying to fight against. It's not a token word, an expression. It's uh, it's very much what we mean. And mainstreaming human rights for us means uh, when we think about social protection, we go back to the basic principles of social and economic rights. We go to these texts that have been developed over the past 75 years that protect all these rights. And there is a panoply of rights. It's not just on individuals. It's not just about rule of law, it is about all the different actors that are entitled to deserve rights. For instance, in the context of MENA, we work very often the rights of children because it's a very big uh, population of children. We have a very uh, young population in MENA, but we also work with the, ref with, the ref with the rights of refugees whose rights have not been guaranteed by many of the Middle East and North Africa countries because they are not signatory of the Geneva Conventions and the protocols. What we are also work is with uh, groups and uh, groups like persons uh, with disabilities, the right for pers the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is a critical set of uh, rights system that we are constantly moving and advancing and each country in the, in the MENA region addresses differently. In Jordan, we're very lucky we have a very robust framework for it. Convention of the Rights of Child, CIDAO, the Convention for the Rights of Women, extremely important as well, not just in the MENA region, but all over the world, like all of these conventions. So that's what it means to us. We uphold this treat, we uphold these conventions, and regardless of whether when the countries at national at the national level have uh, signed for this, have signed and ratified these agreements. We are we are in a happy can we, we can remind governments of their responsibilities and their, how they are duty bearers of these rights. When they have not, then we have to constantly uphold these rights by claiming that we belong to part of an international community. So that's what mainstreaming human rights is. Constantly reminding everyone. Because, yes, that's very good. And also it's good to remember in this moment that just because we have these rights, many people expect that these rights by themselves we will prevent violators from violating the rights. But as we all know, you know, the fact that we have laws does not end the crime, right? So the, the rights actually exist so that we can um, uh, somewhat have a standard and understand when something is right or wrong. Uh, um, we have a Professor uh, Bestford with us. Professor Bestford, you had a very good question. Can you please uh, join us and ask your question? Yes, uh, I'm here, uh, uh, Professor Kierstorach. Uh, can you hear me? Is that yes, okay? very well, okay. very well. Okay. well. That's good. Okay, thank you very much again for inviting me to attend this uh, uh, conference very important on a very important topic, uh, obviously. And I want to thank uh, Ms. La Lagruno as well as uh, Mr. Pace for their input in this uh, regards. Now, apparently I have a longer question, which I had to set it send it in two turns and I will just go uh, straight in to ask, uh, into asking it. And um, uh, the, the question is to the panel, uh, but first let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, my name is Bess Fortreza and I work, and I work as an associate professor of law at the University of Pristina, where I teach human rights. Uh, basically I teach uh, civil and political rights and institutional Mechanism, mechanisms for protecting it, both at uh, the national, European, as well as UN level. So my question is uh, this, uh, due to political issues, Kosovo is not yet a member of the UN or the Council of Europe. 
in the case of the latter, the Council of Europe, uh, Kosovo has started this process of uh, accessions. However, it will probably take years before the admission is completed. Uh, Kosovo has been recognized by 116 UN member states so far, but cannot adhere to the ICCPR and other related HR documents, mm. as well as the European Convention on Human Rights due to political reasons. Uh, is the conditional principle of formally being a member of an international organization impeding the protection of human rights in related cases, especially in cases where a state such as Russia or China, in the case of Kosovo, are uh, impeding Kosovo UN membership using their veto power? The same is with the Council of Europe, where there is a two-third votes requirement for a state to become a member, which in the case of Kosovo has not been the case until recently. And this is why we have started the, the process of, uh, of accession. Nevertheless, Kosovo has committed unilaterally to respect main UN human rights documents as well as the European Convention on Human Rights. And it uses the practice of the European Court of, of Human Rights to interpret those rights within a unique situation of a, so, uh, or of a sort of self-contained regime where individuals cannot sue Kosovo to claim their guaranteed human rights beyond the highest judicial body, which is the Constitutional Court of Kosovo. What's your take on this? And do you see any solution in this? How do you interpret the so-called Vienna Formula Plus for uh, new membership accession, which is enshrined in Article 48 of the ICCPR, for example? Kosovo certainly is not the only case, so it can be applicable in other situations as well. Thank you. I think this, uh, uh, this is a question for Mr. Pace. Mr. Pace, I hope you heard, uh, Professor, uh, you understood the question. He was uh, referring to Kosovo, but he's right. This has a broader implication, and you did discuss the issue of of veto power and how that uh, issue of veto power oftentimes um, serves as a serious obstacle for for protection of human rights. Uh, well, quickly, can you hear me? Yes, very uh, well. You are um, amazing. And I apologize for having to change rooms, but uh, I have been able to, to follow this. Uh, let me just say, uh, one of the most important things that occurred in the two months ago was when uh, the US president, while way over uh, endorsing uh, what the US was going to do for Israel, nevertheless warned the Israeli government, please don't make the same mistakes that we made in launching the war on terror in 2002. And of course, unfortunately, uh, Israel seems to have been making uh, much worse mistakes. Uh, 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 and, and so part of it is lessons learned. And part of the lessons learned on Kosovo was that the Dayton Accords should have had some provisions for uh, review of the Accords and updating the uh, agreement. Uh, and, uh, and I don't believe that those uh, were achieved. And so, uh, but but the 116 is only 14 away from the 130, that would be two thirds of the UN. So part of the goal for Kosovo is to get the additional 14 or 15 governments that have not uh, 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 agreed to have uh, Kosovo admitted to the General Assembly to do so. And, and, and of course, with the Rome Statute, we are at 123 to 125. So we are within literally five to seven uh, state parties to be able to have a two thirds vote, which would allow then the General Assembly of the United Nations, which is a universal body or, or one of the most universal bodies in the world to be able to uh, overcome the veto and the uh, repressive policies of uh, veto members and and the uh, uh, autocratic states that don't want uh, any interference in their domestic affairs at all. So I hope that might provide a little bit of an answer 
to the professor's question. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else has a question? Uh, okay, so then maybe I can ask a question while people are gathering their things. Um, I, I am was really fascinated by that uh, conversation that uh, um, that press conference that you held. It was some times ago in, in 2017, but you spoke about that necessity to establish uh, essentially an instrument or some sort of procedure for any permanent member of the United Nations Security Council to invoke uh, um, a veto. And so um, I'm wondering, did anything happen since then? Because you rightly so pointed, Mr. Pace, I'm talking to you, you rightly so pointed that this um, uh, unrestrained ability of the Permanent Security Council members to uh, invoke veto on any decisions often serves as a very serious uh, obstacle for that responsibility to protect norm. To, to stop the genocide or to uh, to prevent the genocide. And so, it, it, you know, did anything happen with that initiative of S5, as you have called those five countries, five small countries, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Costa Rica, Jordan, and Singapore? Did <laughs> that, uh, how you say, um, proposal ever meant, I mean, ever moved from that stage? Obviously, it's, it's extremely important because many people don't even know how uh, how unorganized these things within the United Nations are. So, uh, you know, can you clar uh, you know explain it a little bit and, and tell us if anything happened since then, or we still have a situation where any permanent member can call a veto in any way, shape, or form, even in, in disregarding the Article 24.2 of the Charter of the United Nations, which you mentioned in that presentation. Well, uh, uh, briefly, unfortunately, I think things have gotten worse, not better in the last uh, seven or eight or eight years. But nevertheless, uh, as you see with the Conference of Parties meeting in the Middle East at the moment and in, in Dubai, uh, there are still 130, 140 governments that do see how important it is to continue to have intergovernmental negotiations and cooperation. I think someone said there's something like 70,000 uh, participants at the COP, including governments, international organizations, national uh, environmental organizations, and others. So, uh, so there is still a very, a very important hope. However, the, the five permanent members of the Security Council are in worse condition of cooperation today. We now realize that the 1990s, when uh, Gorbachev allowed the dissolution of the Soviet Union without any war against any of the states that then became independent uh, countries, um, that that was a extraordinary decade that, as I said, was unfortunately terminated uh, in 2001 by the uh, terrible mis mistakes of the United States in launching the war on terror, et, et cetera. But the General Assembly of the UN still allows a plan. Oh, we, we lost you. We, we, uh, Mr. Pace, you're muted. Been muted? Yeah, you, you, you were muted for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, all I was saying is that uh, I do think the General Assembly remains a place where a uh, 130 governments can get together and continue. And as we've seen in Doha, where you've got all of these governments and 70,000 people working together to try and strengthen international law, environmental uh, conditions, et cetera, uh, this is the hope that's, that coalitions of small and middle power nations can come together in their self-interest and stand up to the biggest economic and political powers and the veto powers and 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 proceed and and they sometimes do now in the last seven years too you've had countries like uh india and south africa and other and brazil and others claim why don't we just create our own uh southern united nations etc but i don't think that would in my own view help the world i think you would have uh 
uh, competing international systems that could lead to a, a, a global confrontation. Nice. And one more short thing. Um, United States have uh, been very vocal opponent to International Criminal Court. Uh, last president before Biden even threatened to arrest uh, judges from the court and <laughs> in every way, shape or form, uh, basically prevent or somehow block them from doing or uh, working. Um, and now this administration have been a little bit more forthcoming because of the Ukraine issue. But so what is, uh, where is the United States now in terms of International Criminal Court? Is it better? Is it worse? Is it, uh, you it's, know, it, is, it, it, it is better, but it, the U.S. has this fundamental conflict where it is happy to enforce international law, but it, it will not accept international law being enforced on it. And and that is the oh, and of course that's the same way Russia feels, China feels, uh, the UK and France as permanent members have had to be have somewhat changed because of the European Union uh, situation. But uh, if they could have it that way, so uh, I, I think it will be a long time before the United States Senate agrees to ratify the Rome Statute. And as I've said, uh, the US, the UK. Uh, committed aggression. They have committed uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity uh, over the years in the war on terror. Uh, Russia has done so also. Um, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if China has done so, but uh, it's, it will be very difficult uh, for that. And let me just say one other thing is that uh, without the veto, I'm not sure that the five countries wouldn't completely drop out and we would end up potentially having World War III overtaking their veto away from them. So how the international community hands, handles this extraordinary challenge is going to be very important. Yeah, well, it, it is um, kind of also <laughs> important for all of us to remember the Security Council was established and the United Nations in general, the main principle is to ensure global peace and security, not justice. And so a lot of us often talk, talking and thinking in terms of justice, but that's not the main objective. Now we have Bianca uh, uh, joining us from Bolivia, and she says she cannot turn the microphone, but she's asking uh, um, uh, regarding the question I pose, do you think invoking, invoking Article 30 from the United Nations, uh, known as Uniting for Peace, would help in anything? of the situation. And she said, she, I, I've been reading that, that during this week, the Security Council will have another meeting, I guess, to discuss the current flashpoints. And so what should be expected? I mean, any one of you can, can comment. Well, I think the United for Peace uh, would be a very interesting uh, situation. That's what the General Assembly did when they decided to try and address the invasion of uh, uh, the Koreas um, and the participation of China way back in the early 50s, et cetera. Uh, I, it is a dangerous thing because you're trying to get the governments of the General Assembly to stand up militarily to others. But my own personal view is for many, many years now has been that there ought to be some kind of enforcement of a peace plan between Palestine and Israel, and there would be a peacekeeping operations in between that uh, would would try to provide the kind of uh, protection for the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, but uh, I could see how very many uh, governments would be very reluctant to put peacekeepers in that position because of the uh, violence of, of uh, militants in both uh, uh, Palestine or Hamas and, uh, and Israel. All right, um, uh, let's kind of, before we conclude, uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Lagorna a question. Dr. Lagorna, you're being involved with this uh, Arab Renaissance for Democracy and Development, in, you know, how, how is all these things, the current situation, working in <laughs> that renaissance? Is it really a renaissance still going on, or or maybe it's uh, a little bit of a, a, a 
uh, cloudy skies right now. What's going on? Because uh, lots of people are losing hope when it comes to human rights and uh, um, those, you know, high principles that we have. Uh, I have and, to apologize very yes. quickly because uh, I'm in a room now that's being taken over by another group <laughs> meeting. So you'll have to excuse me. I've enjoyed Thank being you. part of this and I hope to look at the recording and hear uh, Professor Lagarno's answer. But Thank, you. Thank, you, Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for Thank joining you. us, even in those difficult situations. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Lagarno. Complicated. It's a crowded space. Um, yeah, but you see why he is a hero of human rights. He is fantastic. No, good. Oh, oh, kudos yes. for for Bill yes. Pace. Absolutely fantastic. And I was just going to long, say long that. Time. Yes, I know, I know, and um, it's it's that's why it's important. The, the, the it's the memory of human rights and the future of human rights. Yeah. This is this so, is and, difficult. And people, so going, people like yeah. Pace, Mr. Pace are very important because they contain this memory. So he's exactly you know like exactly. A, I admire him for his efforts. Um, he, he he's been doing this for quite a long time. I so going to what the question he was saying about yes, it is difficult. I think so. Two things. Um, Renaissance. The Renaissance project came from the Arab Spring. That's where the name came from. That was a time of inspiration. Uh, the counter revolutions that happened in 2012 onwards have not diminished the power of the thinking about a Renaissance uh, for the region. And I would say that now more than ever, we still need to hold the ground on these ideas. And this is why uh, we keep working. But as I said, uh, and as Bill was saying, <sighs> The past six, seven years have been ex excruciating, and I don't think the, the, the coming years are going to be much easier uh, in any way, form, or shape. So what's happening now, What today is actually a really critical day, in addition to what is happening at the United Nations. And I would say it has a lot of symbolic meaning for Palestinians and for people in the region, what happens at the United Nations, even if practically things cannot happen, that... Um, uh, Antonio Guterres called, uh, our invoked Article 99 was a critical statement and a highly symbolic statement against the veto power. So I, I really was, I thought uh, uh, Mr. Pace, Bill Pace had a fantastic uh, point that he made about the veto power, the, 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 the two sides of the veto power. If there was no veto power, would we still have an international order where these nations at least sit together and discuss, et cetera? And I think the last discussion related to Article 99, when uh, Antonio Guterres called for for another Security uh, Council meeting by invoking Article 99 was critical for the Middle East and for people to think about it. Of course, there's a lot of disillusionment and uh, the double standards that people are seeing. This is what this, the narrative is in the part of the world that I work in. And um, this is not going to enhance dialogue. At the same time, the solidarity of the United Nations, the, the General Assembly, that has happened through the past two months, it is clear. And countries like Jordan really appreciate it. Jordan was of one, the first country to actually call for a, a United Nations General Assembly uh, meeting and resolution. And those resolutions have been positive towards a, a resolution of the current conflict. That has, a, again, even if it's symbolic, because it cannot, doesn't have an enforcing mechanism, it is critical to show that there is dialogue and there is something cl cl uh, clearly happening that it's not working. Now, in terms of invoking Article 30 and uniting for peace and etc., cetera, um, yeah, the question of having military, and we, there is military presence in Lebanon, let's remember that, of the UN. It's the UNIFIL mission. It's been board, it's in the borders, and actually, I think today or yesterday, it's been, uh, it's been, it has received some attacks, so I don't remember, but I think it's probably the Israeli side, the Lebanese side. In this case, there's just a crossfire. It's, it's a crossfire, and, and it happens. So I think the concern here is, first of all, um, in this case, the state, and the non-state party, uh, as, as you were discussing before, the state party, which is Israel, uh, doesn't want to have that type of solution. I think it's it's been completely off the table. Um, I don't think it's off the table for anyone else, but it is. But the other part is not is not a state actor, so we cannot really um, have this type of the same conversation. We have to have a different type of conversation. 
we think for instance and in this case i put my hat as a spanish uh, citizen that recognition of the state of palestine is critical a step precisely to do that to enforce these mechanisms and help enforce these mechanisms at some level even if it's still not perfect and we still have veto at the united veto power at the united nations so um yeah these are some of the thoughts but today in the middle east and my final thought is an important day there was a of solidarity there was a call um there was a call 48 hours ago for a general strike in the region and today jordan woke up completely silent no one it was a general strike and it has been probably the most powerful general strike that the history in the history of jordan uh non-violent demonstration of solidarity and repudiation of what's happening um in gaza and the west bank so Non-violent, the power of non-violence is critical, and I think today is something that, although the news have not paid much attention internationally, it has been an important day in in countries like Jordan in show of support of solidarity and the power of collective um, non-violent activism. That's very nice. That's very beautiful that people um, do still want to uphold human rights. Lots of people have struggled for it. my personal human rights hero is Malcolm X, right? Who oftentimes is being talked about in a different light, but he was actually a human rights hero. And uh, I sometimes think what he would do today, and he will probably be very, very vocal in holding that ground that we have achieved thus far. We have a question from uh, Ms. Charbeze, Ms. Charbeze, please turn on your mic and, and ask your question. That will probably be the last question for today. We will conclude shortly afterwards. Please go ahead. I hope she hears us. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Please. Okay, I have a, just a short question for Mr. Williams. Uh, does he see no a better chance for two-state solutions in Middle East? Well, uh, I think uh, Mr. Pace will not be able to answer. Uh, 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 Ms. Sherbeze is a, a, a very well-known journalist from Kosovo, so we appreciate your presence today. But maybe, Dr. Lagrono, maybe you can comment. Do you think the Two-state solution is now closer or further away. You know, I, I or or, what do you think is it happening with that concept? Um, well, I have an opinion like everyone else. I think uh, if I have to listen to the different narratives as a historian, I listen to narratives and I read narratives. And I think right now the narratives are very far away from each other. And two-state solutions we have. To a state solution, probably as, as a part as it can be, the problem is what makes a feasible state and a viable state. So this question goes hand in hand, what it means to have a viable state, particularly for Palestine. And in this case, Palestine in the current form with the occupation in the West Bank is not viable. As we speak, Gaza has been completely grounded. To, it, it's been destroyed to the ground. So it's not a viable state anymore, <laughs> not even a microstate. Uh, and it will take... It will take many years for Gaza to be rebuilt uh, and, and have some sort of normalcy for its people, not to speak about the trauma, etc. of what this. This conflict, this current conflict is taking us many, many decades back. Um, the conversation, actually, if you read different narratives and even narratives coming from very progressive sectors and very peace oriented sectors from Israeli society, they are calling for a one state for everyone. Uh, because it, so that it can be viable and a real uh, uh, and a real conversation. But every single day that passes, that there's no ceasefire, any solution of any kind is farther and farther away. These are families that have been destroyed, um, and these are. It's, it's not about the material damage. It's about the very strenuous narrative that has been happening over the past over sixty days, seventy days now, and. It's nowhere we don't see any end near side. So again, for in my own opinion, and reading uh, scholars like Kilampape, and I, uh, I urge you to read the work of and, and the, the last comments by 
Israeli historian Ilan Pape, based in Exeter University, fantastic about the meaning, because we're talking about not even two states. In his own opinion, this is the beginning of the end. This is, he is very radical. He thinks this is actually the end, the beginning of the end of the experiment of Israel, as he likes to call it. And he's Israeli himself, he holds an Israeli passport. So I think the two-state solution, one-state, two-state solution is farther than any other time because it's no viable any longer. But even even in Israel, if I may say, uh, the agriculture in Israel, there were Palestinian farmers farming. Then there were Thai workers working in the fields in Israel. Now there are no Thai workers. There's no Palestinian workers who have been banned from going into Israel as a result of this conflict. Someone will need to farm the land and no one is there to farm the land. If there's no security, there will be no workers going. So I think there are, we have to start, they have to start looking at what economically viable or not viable in that sense. And politically, again, I think we're farther than ever from any one or two state solution. Well, I'd, I'd like us to end up on, on, on more positive uh, and optimistic note. I have heard this uh, idea of confederacy, some sort of confederacy from <laughs> Ipkri, uh, Israeli-Palestinian research, uh, I forgot the exact na name of their, uh, what that acronym stands for, but they were the ones also proposing that several years ago, uh, or, or some sort of, you know, a joint kind of project where people can both have some sort of viable uh, alternative. But obviously, you know, this uh, issue is overpowering uh, uh, nowadays news and all discussions. However, we want to keep the human rights uh, uh, on top of our minds, and it is optimistic and nice to see that on both sides, even there, you have people who are strongly calling for human rights to be upheld and to be respected and to be seen as really uh, a standard for interactions. And, and I always say that to my students, these times, precisely times like this, are the times when we need the most to remember the human rights and all other rights that we fought for, because it is easy to uphold them in the, in the good times. But when the times come like this, challenging times, times of war, times of disaster, this is when we have to remember that uh, principle of human rights. And I completely agree with Mr. Pace when he said that, imagine if we don't have them. Uh, the world is terrible as it is, but imagine if we don't have them. And this is where our MIRI Institute would like to also project ourselves. We would like to be the voice for these uh, uh, various types of minorities who insist that they don't have to be state actors to be seen as people, as human beings. And we promise we will do that. So I have to end. Uh, director criticized me last time for being over time. So, um, uh, <laughs> I don't want to violate any rules again. Um, <laughs> so I have to end at this point, and I uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, somebody have asked a question about recording. Uh, Dr. Surova, you said you're going to post the recording soon, right? Uh, you want to join us and uh, say something in conclusion before we end? Yeah, thank you, Mirsad. Uh, the recording will be shortly uh, available on our website. So uh, if you want to, us to send you a link, uh, please share with me in a private chat your email address. And yes, Mirsad, when you are complaining, I have to complain also. <laughs> because I fight for my rights. Last time you asked me at the end the question, but now I had, I had some questions that I wanted to raise also. I don't want to overtake your time. I had particularly question for uh, Mr. Pace, uh, but uh, maybe uh, I just want to summarize that both speakers have spoke about declaration, United Nations, what was achieved, what was good, what is not so, uh, uh, that not so bright future maybe uh, wait for us, but uh, I, I was just, so, but most uh, of what, what the speakers were talking was uh, from the, uh, they were talking about uh, international organizations or state, yeah, so states, but I don't hear people, you know, human rights are about the 
people. And I, I'm wondering, I, I have like practical uh, questions. So if uh, Logrono wants to uh, add to that, like how to bring these human rights to everyone, not to the people, but to everyone, you know? And I, uh, I, I was teaching minority rights in, in, in on the university, and I was always uh, introducing the topic to my students that when it comes to minority rights, but ne nevertheless also human rights, there is always a tension who has to have priority. So individual, community, or the state. And I'm thinking that individuals, persons are losing in this fight, that we all the time speak about states, yeah? Or then about communities, but we never take the individual perspective and I will uh, uh, finish uh, with this. And I think that the problem is that even with this, um, declaration with the international standards with, with even in democracies where where we have the rule of law there are a lot of examples how as i was mentioning those most vulnerable and marginalized do not have access to rights you know and this has to be this has to be uh, addressed so that's all from my side i don't know if uh, doctor yeah, if yeah, if I may, actually, no, I think you have a very, I think this is one of, it's a critical question when looking at human rights. Human rights are individual events, right? It's to protect the rights of every person. Uh, but I think there's an issue, and this is why, whether it's about communities, a state, well, states are the coercive. We have to go into the theory of a state and a state formation. But when we, if we think about the question from, and I'll tell you a very practical experience, from a civil society organization, when we are looking about observing human rights, communities and civil society, more specifically organizations, what is the added value of having, but also it could be a, it could be a problem, what is the added value of having organizations, civil society organizing and within communities and working with communities and individuals? You have accountability, you have the right to look for accountability and make someone accountable. It is more complicated when we are uh, looking at, particularly in terms of processes of development, et cetera, to ask for accountability at every single individual. So I guess for the sake of that, keeping that alive, accountability, there is a practical reason why civil society makes a difference and it is important that we uphold to it without, and that goes without, of course, inflicting or uh, negating the rights of individuals. But Human rights, by in our understanding, do protect those individual rights. Um, so I think I don't think there's any, any clear solution to this issue, and I see absolutely your point. But this is from uh, from the side of practicing within civil society. What what we see? If I may uh, interact, also like what what the, the question you're asking is not a bad question. You know, I think that was the question that Hannah Arendt asked in 1948 when she said. 1943 when she said who has rights to have rights right yes. that's a critical point of this discussion right but we know from studying political science that those how you say institutional structures essentially limit or empower individuals so it's not one or the other it's all of them and as we uh, those of us who teach human rights we say the goal is not to um, to belittle the role of the state the goal is to turn the state into uh, an active promoter of the human rights. That means we want states to be the, the, uh, the, the agent in upholding this. And to be able to do that, especially, uh, I may say, I have to say it like that, forgive me, but I have to, especially in the Western world where we supposedly have a, a representative democracy. So we have to hold our governments who are running the states up to that task. So it is upon us individual. The human rights don't exist, like he said, written in the stars. They are there to be upheld by every one of us as individuals. And for us to hold the, the people who are entrusted in administering the state to turn the states into actors which will re, uh, uh, respect human rights for everyone, for that individual that you're talking about. Um, and so... It, it, it's really uh, interconnected on these three levels, on the individual, on the group level, and on the state level. And so you cannot have it on one level. You have to essentially um, somehow establish the principle on all three levels, and then 
we will all enjoy it. As I said, we understand human rights as a minimum standard, not as a maximum standard. Maximum standard, you know, the sky is the limit. But we want to see that human rights, agreed upon human rights. Now, we do have a tendency to call for human rights everything. You know, it's been called human rights. No, let's stick to the agreed upon human rights presented to us in the Declaration of, of uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and then subsequent other documents to it. And let's stick to them and agree that this is the bare minimum of our interactions. And then we as individuals insist within our groups, which we are members of, all kinds of groups, ethnic groups, religious groups, uh, you know, political groups, whatever groups we are part of, and then also demand from these administrators of the states to uphold them. So uh, that way, that concept works. It's a, one of those, as I usually say to my students, one of those strange, strange ideas which exists in our minds, but we work hard to re reify it. Just like uh, if I tell you I love you, what does that mean? Really, it means very little until I show it and I express it and I kind of uh, upheld it every day in every uh, interactions that I have uh, with you. So um, these human rights are dependent on each one of us. That's an important part of the whole discussion. No one else will do it for us. I mean, I mean I'm sorry for you know being passionate about it, but um, I, I always encounter this discussion, what level is most important one. Each mm -hmm. level is important and without all three levels participating and working on it is not going to work. Mr. Chairman, can I come in to... Sure, uh, sure, Camilio. Yes, please. Yeah, an aspect following what, what Lucia uh, said. Uh, I have been working with some groups. I'm from, I, I'm based in Vienna. I am um, Austrian, um, but a native of the Philippines. I have been working with some groups now on the problem of redeployment of labor from the Philippines, for instance, to Austria. This is a problem that's not only happening in, in Austria, it's happening all over the world, where we're <laughs> saying, yes, there are some jobs, and particularly with AI coming up, I suppose there will be more and more need for resources who will not only take up the dirty work, but take up a human, give a humanity to the types of jobs that have been um, now taken over by what we call them, our machines and our beautiful ele electronic devices. You know, the problem is one of um, recruitment agencies who are continuing the economic problems that will not really look at human rights to begin with. And the next problem would be governments who are interested in having remittances as a way of uh, getting all of those things that they, that they have been getting. Um, there are um, workers um, who have now been controlled by the establishment of ministries of migrant workers, like they have, for instance, established in the Philippines. Um, I wonder whether their interests are to uh, protect them and enhance, as you say, or empower the human rights of workers who go abroad, or in fact to limit those in order to be able to get what they want to get in these uh, trading uh, deals. Um, now, I wonder how that comes into the picture. I know we, sh we should be ending this, and my ap appeal to uh, Shvet Lucia and to the chair is perhaps to say, Let's not end today's discussion as commemorating the 75th anniversary. There are many other issues, and we probably should consider this discussion today as the start of a series of discussions on different aspects of human rights, just so, so as not to open um, the debate again and uh, go over your time limits. But thank you very, very much to all of the speakers and to the chair. Excellent thank point. You thank you for your, for your, thank you for your comment. In fact, International Labor Organization was the precursor for the whole idea of human rights. So the idea of human rights started from International Labor Organization, which essentially actively fought 
for the human rights of workers, such as eight hour workday, <laughs> which we now conveniently shifted into eight hour work shift, not anymore eight hour work day, but it's eight hour work shift. So you can work multiple shifts in different places and stuff, so on and so forth. So yes, um, uh, many questions ahead of us and we will have to address them in the future. And uh, um, that's uh, for the end. I was essentially planning to read a poem which is now the entrance of United Nations by Sadi Shirazi, a Persian poet, which essentially is an answer to that question that also um, Svetlusha have pointed, but to Surovam. And the poem says, human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. And that will be uh, all that I have to say for today. Well, I again, thank you all for joining us from all over the world. And uh, I see you, we'll see you next time. We promise we will continue this uh, focus on these issues, which now many people want to take off the table. Thank you. Thank you.